Did you know that certain garments we wear are named after military officers, a battleground and the site of nuclear explosions? What does Tennyson's poetry have to do with any of this? Or the Frenchman who invented the flying trapeze? All this and more coming up. Do watch. But first, please like, follow, subscribe to The English Nut on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. If you already have, thanks. The cardigan is a sweater that is open down the front. Traditionally, it's made of wool and comes with buttons. Modern cardigans may have a zip instead of buttons. They can be made of cotton or synthetic fibers instead of wool. And trendy ones may not have buttons or a zip and hang open down the front. The cardigan is my favorite comfort garment in winter, like the clothing equivalent of chicken soup or a warm hug. Singer-songwriter Taylor Swift has a song titled Cardigan. It goes, And when I felt I was an old cardigan under someone's bed, you put me on and said I was your favorite. The late Kurt Cobain's green cardigan would be able to relate to this song. This cardigan worn by the front man of the rock band Nirvana during a concert was auctioned for $137,500 in 2015. It had a burn hole, a missing button and discoloration on or near its two external pockets. Of course, its high price was connected to its legendary wearer, not to its intrinsic value. The cardigan is named after James Thomas Brudenell, 7th Earl of Cardigan, who is said to have worn a version of it to keep warm during military campaigns. Brudenell, a major general in the British Army, led the failed charge of the Light Brigade. At the Battle of Balaclava against the Russians during the Crimean War in 1854. The Light Brigade was what the British Light Cavalry was called. Lord Tennyson wrote and published the narrative poem The Charge of the Light Brigade just six weeks after the event. It speaks of the bravery of the cavalry in carrying out orders despite the knowledge that the operation was doomed from the start. Let me recite the first two stanzas of the poem. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death, rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why. There's but to do and die into the valley of death wrote the 600. The word league as used in the poem is an old measure of distance equivalent to about three miles. The light cavalry was supposed to have been sent on a different mission but ended up going on this doomed frontal attack as a result of unclear communication by Lord Raglan, the army commander. Lord Raglan's name too became a clothing related term. It refers to a garment with a sleeve that extends in one piece right up to the collar with diagonal seams from armhole to neck. This is called a raglan sleeve. Lord Raglan had lost his arm in battle and coat maker Aquascutum had designed a coat with this kind of sleeve especially for him. Coming back to the Battle of Balaclava during which the charge of the Light Brigade took place, it too lent its name to an article of clothing, the Balaclava. This is a tight-fitting knitted cap which covers the whole head and neck and leaves only a part of the face, usually the eyes, exposed. It is used by mountain climbers, skiers, soldiers and others who need protection from extreme cold and wind. The word comes from the name of the battle which itself is taken from the name of the town of Balaclava in the Crimean Peninsula in Eastern Europe. This type of cap was worn by the soldiers fighting there to fend off the vicious cold. So this one battle is associated with the names of three articles of clothing, two based on the names of army officers and one on the town that gave the battle its name. Quite remarkable. Let's move from the military to the civilian. Jules Léotard was famous in his lifetime for inventing the Flying Trapeze Act. His name is pronounced as Jules Léotard in English. His father owned a gymnasium and taught him the parallel bars at an early age 
At some point, Leotard got the idea of suspending ropes from a high bar and thus the Aerial Trapeze Act was born. He practiced on a trapeze above his father's swimming pool in Toulouse so that he would not get hurt even if he fell. He became a wildly popular performer in circuses and music halls in Paris and London. And he performed his act wearing a skin-tight one-piece outfit that extended from his upper thighs to his shoulders. It was ideal for the flying trapeze where any bits of loose clothing could be a hindrance. Lyotard himself called the garment a maillot a general French term for body-hugging shirts and sports shirts. But because he made the outfit popular, it was eventually named after him. Note that the acute accent on the E in the name Leotard is dropped in the word Leotard. Today, the use of Leotards is widespread. They are worn by male and female acrobats, gymnasts, dancers, figure skaters, athletes and wrestlers. Now let's move to an even skimpier garment, the bikini. I'm sure you know what this is. It's a two-piece swimsuit for women. It essentially consists of two triangles of fabric on top to cover the chest and two triangles of fabric for the bottom part covering front and back while revealing the navel, which was considered eyebrow-raising exposure in Western society at that time. Do you know what the bikini is named after? You may be surprised to know that this too has a military connection. In 1946, Louis Réard, a French automobile and clothing designer, introduced this design, naming it after Bikini Atoll, a coral reef in the Marshall Islands, where the Americans had conducted the first public test of a nuclear bomb just four days earlier. He expected his design to have an explosive impact on Paris and send out shockwaves in the world of fashion and beyond, hence the name. And it lived up to its name. The design was opposed by many groups, including feminists, who believed that it was designed for the benefit of men and not women. France banned it from its beaches, Germany from its public pools. But women discreetly bought and wore the bikini anyway, as legendary actresses like Brigitte Bardot, Raquel Welch and Ursula Andrews started wearing a bikini in their films, society began to accept it. By the later years of the 20th century, the bikini became widely accepted not just as swimwear but as sportswear for beach volleyball and bodybuilding. A last word, it would be more correct to say that the French designer reintroduced the bikini because there is art from the Greco-Roman world dating back to 1400 BC that depicts female athletes wearing bikini-like garments. I'm the English Nut. Bye for now.